united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Welcome back as we continue to look at the 70th week of Daniel or the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a seven year period at the end of the age. We would ordinarily say the end of the world when Christ uh, returns to the earth to rule and to reign and take back what is rightfully his and to take his own to be with him. I might say to you that a lot of this comes in, in uh, Matthew chapter 24, which is actually where we're going to start today. And if you have your Bible, I would get, it suggest to you that you turn there to Matthew chapter 24, verse number 1. Also, if you can keep your finger there and go to Revelation chapter 6, and if you have an iPad, then uh, your finger's not going to work real well, except to switch it back and forth. But these two books in two chapters have a chronology which shows the end times. And they're given by Christ. These are not things which are written in a book. They're not some author's imagination. It's not something which forces scriptures to fit what we think is true. These are things which Christ wrote. And had the church looked at these two and, and uh, taken in from exactly what they say, many of the problems we've had over the years would never have occurred. I don't know how many of you actually look at, uh, at uh, the early church fathers, but in the early church fathers, uh, there's several in there who looked at scripture and looked at the end of time, including Arrhenius and uh, his teacher, who was also taught by the apostle John. So these are men which are very close to the beginning, and they're men which are, are, um, would know uh, closer to what we would know. Both of these men, all of these early church fathers, I should say, actually believed we would face the Antichrist. Now what that means is, in, sh in the short of it, is that we're going to go into that seven-year period. We talked a little bit about before, and sometimes it gets to be uh, pushed for time here, whether we are raptured, we are taken to be with Christ before that seven year period, at the middle of it. I believe we're not taken at the middle. Please don't put me down as mid trib, but we are pre wrath. We come to a point when the wrath of God begins, we're taken out. That's a promise that's given to us by Christ. That's something which is repeated. We're not here for the wrath of God. The wrath of God has already been taken for us by Jesus Christ, by the Messiah. And I use the term Messiah or Mashiach because we have both Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians. Once we become a Christian, believer in Christ or a believer in the, in the Messiah, we become one. We're blended together. I've heard people say to me that the church and Israel cannot be on the earth at the same time. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but for the last 70 years, We've been there, and we have uh, certainly been very close. And many Christian believers helped to fund the restart of the land of Israel. But the big thing is, if you'll take a look at Matthew chapter 24, and it says, Jesus went out, and he departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And let me just say, the temple... Uh, we see it today as the Golden Dome or the Mosque in, of Omar in, in Jerusalem. The temple was a, a most, one of the most beautiful buildings the world had ever seen. Even the, the one that Herod rebuilt and Herod himself uh, funded, even that one was a beautiful building. We find stones from it today. And Christ says, see you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not let be left here one stone upon another. That shall not be thrown down. Let me say that we've seen those stones, and there are some on the foundation stones that are actually stones that weigh hundreds of tons. They are immense, and one of those is probably one of the largest stones in, in the history of building in this world. It is immense. 
And we know that these, you know, this is a building that was absolutely significant, and it's one that Jews had a tendency to worship. It's also a place, as Christ looks at it, says it's going to be destroyed. It's going to be gone, and it's going to be gone because the Jewish people at this time refused to follow Christ. In fact, in this case, and please believe me, do not misunderstand what I'm going to say, they had him crucified. It not, does not belong to the fault of the Jew. Above the head of Christ during that crucifixion, written in three languages, the king of the Jews. But it's written in Hebrew, it's written in Greek, it's written in Latin. In other words, it covers all the three main languages in that area. Pilate made sure that everybody understood this is our responsibility by the same token. The fact that he is crucified means he's crucified for our sin. He's crucified for my sin. He's crucified for your sin, if you're a Christian. And the blood of Christ is what sheds upon us and makes us white as snow. I uh, at one point took some blood thinners and everything I touched, I would get a cut. And every time I would get a cut, I would get somewhere that the blood that would get on my shirt or pants or whatever it may be. And I was always amazed. And I went back to scripture and thought about how the blood of Christ makes you white as snow. Instead of staining, it takes out the stain of sin and gives us the life everlasting, which he's promised. But he also says in verse three, as he set upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us what shall these things be and what shall be and I want you to look at the wording here, the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. Now, end of the world can also be translated as the end of the age. So he's not looking necessarily at, at the end of the world where it's just obliterated. He's looking more at the reformation of the world or a new world, however it may be. But there's a, a thousand year reign that he's going to prepare the, the world for. So he begins to, to, uh, to deal to them or talk to them about what's going to occur. And the first thing he starts out with is take heed, verse number four, that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name and saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Looking at the slide, we see that there's a, a time and a place where there's a handshake which is given and a white horse and a one underneath it. And that's taken from Revelation chapter six Revelation chapter 6, where John writes, when he says, I saw the lamb opened up one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunders, and one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now notice very, very carefully, he had a bow, but he had no arrows. He's, a, he's the antichrist. He is one who is going to be against Christ. He brings war. Christ is the prince of peace. He will bring peace when he returns. So it, he gives a list of seals that he goes through, and we did last time when we were doing this segment, a list of seals that he opens up. Second seal being war, the third seal being death, fourth seal being the the disease, the, the world is being destroyed by the war that's been there. The fifth seal is the one of the martyrs who will die at the hand of Satan and his minions as, um, as the world progresses. But you know, the same thing is said here in, in, in Matthew 24, and time's short, so it, it makes it kind of hard, makes it for a push here, but, but Matthew 24 gives us the same chronology. And you can read through this and see it on its own because he's going to tell you the same thing. We as Christian people are going to be cast out of the house. We as Christian people are going to be deserted by what we think are our friends. We're going to be killed. You can say, how in the world can that happen? Well, it's the same thing as what we've heard where Christians have been blamed for the coronavirus. That's foolishness. Or that we are said to be anti-science. I want you to know that's that's definitely not true of me at all. And that's not true of anybody that I know. I do disagree with much of science, but I'm not anti-science. I'm anti-false facts. 
So when we look at this, and I, you know, if you have your Bible again, I want you to go on down to uh, verse number 10, verse number nine. It says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. These are Christian people. They've been asked to deny Christ. They have not. They've held true. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That's an odd prayer, isn't it? It's not what we think about in terms of what we should pray for at all. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little, little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now I need to say to you, when we looked at, at uh, the last segment here, the sixth seal is something that the wrath of God starts on. That's important. Remember, wrath of God does not equal a hurricane. It does not equal a, a 6.9 or 7.9 earthquake. And it's not just something which is singular in nature. It happens once and then everything is repaired. That's not what the wrath of God is. The wrath of God is the destruction of this universe as we know it. Now, we're kept safe from that because we're raptured out. And I think, as you can see on the chart, we are raptured out when the sixth seal begins. It says we have a silence that occurs here, a silence in heaven for 30 minutes. Nothing is heard. And that silence indicates there's something that's about to happen that is so tremendous, so shocking, that even in heaven it's considered to be something that is tragic. And it is tragic because it is the wrath of God that's going to begin. Look back, at, if you can, back to your scriptures in verse number 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black and sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Stop and think about what this is, because this sixth seal says there's a great earthquake, so great, so tremendous, and it links it to the sun becoming black. I can't be sure and, you know, completely as to what this might be, but it could be something which creates so much dirt and so forth in the air that it blots it out. Let me assure you one thing. This is not an eclipse. It's saying that there's a darkness that comes on the earth, a darkness, perhaps the same type of darkness that was there when Christ was crucified. And by the way, that darkness is, was worldwide, and we have references and records to it. And the moon becomes as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as fig trees cast her in timely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And wait a minute, I'm not sure what the stars of heaven are here. I per personally think these are meteors. These are some type of, of small uh, uh, things which are coming back into the atmosphere. Uh, they're coming in and we see them crashing into the earth. Well, I mean, all of a sudden, the earth is shaken by a tremendous earthquake. We have what would look like the stars of heaven falling upon the earthquake. We, and it's something which is so tremendous, it's changing the whole appearance of both the universe and of the earth itself. If you look back at Matthew 24, <clears throat> Matthew 24, And let me make sure I get to the right verse here. Verse number 15, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, these are the words of Christ. They're not my words. They're not something that we've copied or changed. These are the words of Christ. He's saying the abomination of desolation sits in the temple. It sits in the renewed temple in Jerusalem. He sits in the Holy of Holies. And he says, I am God. I am God, not Christ, not the God of the universe. I am God. 
And he's someone that's, that's in, uh, completely possessed by Satan, if not Satan himself. And he is sitting there, and as he does, it says that when this begins, when this occurs, and that abomination of desolation is sitting there, he said, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, and let, them which is, what's, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world till this time, no, nor, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. You know, it's, it's uh, again and again, there's a, a difference here of the elect. And a lot of people would make that to Jews who were left on, on earth. I don't think so. It just says the elect. It says it not just in Matthew, but it says it which we claim to be or look to be a, a gospel to the Jews, but it says it to other places. So it can't be just to the Jews. It's got to be to both. But the big thing here is the wrath of God is something that's so severe. It's affecting the heavens. It's affecting the earth. It's an ongoing process that is destroying the earth. It is something which is entirely different. If we go back to, to Revelation chapter 6, verse number 15, it says, The kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. You know what's kind of interesting? Wouldn't you think that these terrible things that are happening, wouldn't they go to Christ and ask for help? And instead, they don't go to Christ. They don't go to God and pray and ask for relief from this at all. They don't ask and plead for mercy. They don't want to repent. Instead, they ask to hide. There's no great uh, renewal or any that uh, um, takes place in that seven-year period. Nothing like that at all shows anywhere. I've heard a lot of things that are said, but I just can't find any reference point to it. But I'll tell you what the rest of that verse says. It says, Hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. From the wrath of the Lamb. That's the first time that wrath is mentioned. The next verse says, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? All of a sudden now, he's saying and talking about wrath. And I want you to understand what this is called the day of the Lord. I want you to understand fully what this is and what it means. So let me skip over here to one of the other slides, and we'll come back to this later. The sign of the sun. Now remember, we're looking for the sign of the Son of Man. And it's a sign, a single sign. And the apostles are asking him, you know, what will be the sign? Matthew 24, 30 says, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Verse 29 says, tells me when immediately after the tribulation of those days, immediately after the time and place where Satan has been, has been uh, 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 martyring uh, Christian people, and he is beginning to talk then about the sun and the moon dark, the stars fall. He says, the day of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 13. By the way, there's thousands of references to this. Isaiah 13, 6, for the day of the Lord is at hand. In verse number 10 of Isaiah says, the stars, the sun, and the moon are darkened. Verse 11 says, I will punish the world. Verse 13, it's called wrath. It's called the wrath of God. It's unique. It's different. It's the same thing in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. The sun becomes black. The moon is blood as blood. The stars fall. The heaven rolls back. It's the wrath of the Lamb. It's the great day of His wrath. Notice the, the reality. And as we go through these, you could go to almost, almost any book of the Bible, and you could find this. This is a time and a place when literally the wrath of the Lamb 
begins, and it's, it begins a destruction of not just the earth, but of the universe. Joel 1.15 says, the day of the Lord is at hand. Joel 2.31 says, the sun is turned unto darkness, look very carefully, before certain things occur. You know, when you look at it, it's a preacher of wrath, you need to recognize and realize there are certain things that have to occur before the rapture. Not just his return, but before the rapture. Joel 3.15 says the sun and the moon are darkened. Amos 5.18, the day of the Lord is darkness. Acts 2.20 is a repeat of Joel. It says the sun is darkened, the moon becomes his blood. Ezekiel 30-3 is a cloudy day, the day of the heathen. 1 Thessalonians 5.2 it says the day of the Lord is like a, comes like a thief in the night. You know that's true. He comes like a thief in the night. Sometime you need to go back and read those verses. Now, it's, we're looking here at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And when you look at that, it tells you that he comes as a thief in the night. But then he turns right around and says to us, we know the season, not the day, not the hour. He says we versus they. In other words, we as opposed to nonbelievers. It does not, should not catch us as a thief in the night. We should be able to see it's the, the season is here. Not the day, not the hour, but the season. You know, sometimes I look around and lately when I've gone out in the morning at school, it's different than what it is. We get the 90 degree temperature in the daytime, but we get to, the mornings are very cool. And I know that we're in fall and that we're approaching winter. I can see the signs. I know they're coming. I don't know what time the first freeze is going to hit. I don't know what time the first snowfall is going to hit, but I do know that winter time is coming. Isaiah chapter 2, verse number 12 is the same thing. It's a time of God shaking the earth. It's the destruction from the Almighty. It's not just, in other words, it's not just shaking one area of the earth. It's shaking the entire earth. And we have heavenly signs that are there. It's a divine wrath and anger. It's terror. It's the punishment for evil and wickedness. It's a time of darkness in the heavens, and it's a time of fire from the Lord. And it's the wrath of God against the nations of the earth. Be sure that what you realize, and, and what I'm not saying, is that Christians are here. Christians, whether it be Gentile or Jew, are not here. We've been taken. We have been taken in the rapture. But at the same time as we are going up in the rapture, we find that Christ is coming down in his second coming. You can say, no, 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 there's a time and a space between the two. No, when I look in Scripture, I find they're occurring at the same time. Look in Matthew chapter 24. Look in Revelation chapter 6. Because you're going to find that those two are concurrent. The coming of God's wrath indicates that he's winding everything up. I, I, I have to look and say the day of his wrath, it's not seven years long has been portrayed by, by so many in, in the pre-trib rapture. It's not seven years. His wrath lasts for a short time, and, and thank God. Praise God for that. It always starts with the same signs. And, you know, there won't be any mourning or scorning, scor uh, scorning of God on this, this day. It's, it's give me rocks. Give me something to hide from it. It's the return of Elijah the prophet to preach. And do we recognize and realize in Malachi chapter 4, Verses 1 through 5, Elijah has to return before that great day. He has to come before that great day. And that ought to tell us right off the bat that the wrath begins on that great day. When it begins, Elijah has to already be here. We haven't looked yet, and we'll have to look in the future, but we haven't looked yet. But, you know, there's the two witnesses that are going to come. One of those almost certainly has to be Elijah because he's significant because he's never died. So is Enoch. And Enoch is a Gentile. Elijah is a Jew. Enoch is a Gentile. And here's the picture of the church and a picture of the Jewish nation. And they're together and they witness together and they are killed in the city of Jerusalem. But those things have to happen before the day of the Lord, before the wrath of God. So I think when we look at it, and I know that there are many out there who will say uh, that there's a time in, between the rapture and the time in the 70th week begins. 
I, I don't know what dispensation is, does this fall in. Now, some of you don't know what that means, but some of you will. The key here is it's not a time and a place where there's a difference or a space of time between the rapture and the beginning of the 70th week. It's the fact that the rapture and the second coming come at the same time and they come in the middle of that or, or right after the middle of that 70th week of Daniel. And I don't want you to be confused. And as we look, we, we're going to stop here for this morning. But Elijah and Moses and Enoch are mentioned most frequently as the two witnesses. And this fits very well with uh, what's been said. By the way, I will tell you, the early church fathers, Polycarp, Irenaeus, others, all believe that it's Enoch and Elijah were the two witnesses. Now, on the Antichrist, they said that they'll know only when it finally occurs. And I think that's still true. We'll know when the time comes. But Elijah and Enoch make perfect two witnesses, and they will be preaching for a period of three and a half years. You know, if you think kind of a, with a, some logic here, if the earth is being destroyed, if we have the stars from heaven that are falling, whether it be meteorites or whatever they may be, when we get all of the destruction of the earthquake, all of our communications are cut off. The earth is dark. We might also have some other effects that would come into, into play there. When all of that's going on, if those two witnesses are killed, one of the last things that would occur right before the wrath starts is the two witnesses are killed. They lay in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. And you know what? After that, there's no way of communication being set for all the world so that they can know and see what's going on. Can I suggest to you again, the key here is not knowing all the details of prophecy. None of us know all the details. It's a great time sometimes to speculate. It's a, you know, it sometimes is uh, very popular to talk about the vaccine. And, and uh, my son makes the, uh, is making, uh, his plan is making the needles for the vaccine. And somebody asked me the other day with a smile, is it big enough for the chip? I mean, we hear all kinds of things that are coming out now about, about the vaccine. We hear all kinds of things about so many things that, that are a one world government. And I'm sure that some are very true. I can't stop those things. I can't know for sure exactly what is there. The one thing I can bank on, the one thing I'm sure is that Jesus Christ has promised. If I come to him and asking him for forgiveness, if I make him my Lord and Savior, and please let me stress, it's Lord and Savior. If I do that and I commit my life and my trust, I place my faith in him, I have nothing to worry. And I can know that in the end, I can see him return, see him lift us up into the air. And if I do pass before that time, I know that I'll be given a new body and I can look forward to a time and a place when I will be with him forevermore and that I will be safe and secure for all eternity. I beg of you that you will take the time to consider what I've said. I appreciate you being with us and we will look forward to seeing you again.